Bonjour Wine Snobs, bienvenue à Wine Snob TV. Aujourd'hui nous célébrons le jugement de Paris. Today we're celebrating the judgment of Paris. So what is the judgment of Paris? Well, it's an event, a critical event, a milestone um, in wine history that has been documented to exhaustion. Um, so I'm not going to attempt today to yet again document the entire event, but um, the Wikipedia page uh, does a pretty good job of summarizing it. So I'm going to go ahead and read from there. The Paris wine tasting of 1976, also known as the Judgment of Paris, was a wine competition organized in Paris on the 24th of May, 1976, by Stephen Spurrier, a British wine merchant and his colleague Patricia Gallagher, in which French judges carried out two blind tastings comp comparisons, one of top quality Chardonnays and another of red wines, Bordeaux wines from France and Cabernet Sauvignon from California, a Californian wine rated best in each category, which caused surprise as France was generally regarded as being the foremost producer of the world's best wines. Spurrier sold only French wine and believed that the California wines would not win. So, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the movie Bottle Shock. <laughs> if you haven't watched the movie Bottle Shock, I highly recommend it. Take a look at it, open a bottle of wine, Put it on on a slow night and enjoy the show. It does a really good job of, of telling the story and the journey that Steven Spurrier made um, out to California prior to the Judgment of Paris and discovering uh, New World wines. I think very often and the Judgment of Paris is portrayed as a triumph of New World wines over French wines, or that somehow Napa wines are better than French wines. <laughs> um, I don't think that was the point of it. Um, you know, there's a, I think there's a bigger lesson uh, to that whole journey that Steven Spurrier made. Um, and it's that you have to stay off the beaten path. I think the true hero of that story was not Napa. Um, it could have been anywhere else. It could have been Chile. It could have been, you know, any of the other emerging new wine regions. I think the true hero of that story um, was Steven Spurrier. And I say this because this was an era where I think the wine world at large was stuck in this singular mind um, and lacked a lot of creativity um, and imagination uh, that you would find in the new world. Um, there are a lot of entrenched and established um, regions, especially from France, um, but uh, that by no means was a determination that they held some sort of monopoly on <laughs> good wine. I think by now, if you're watching this, um, you should know that the French do not have a monopoly on good wine. <laughs> um, the moral of the story was not that Napa somehow magically made the best wines over anybody else, uh, least of all the French. I think the moral of the story was a lot of people, there are a lot of people around the world making amazing wines. And I say, for this, I say Steven Spurrier was the real hero of that story because he challenged himself to think outside of the norm, outside of the box. And in this day and time, in the 70s, we're talking the 70s, there was no internet, communication was really sketchy at best. Um, he challenged himself to fly around the world on his own dime, um, despite many odds, and explore, open his mind to a whole new 
set of possibilities when it came to wine and how wine is made, how it's appreciated, and the stories behind the wines from out here in California. It's, uh, this is the story, if you're not familiar with the story, this is the story of the def defining moment that Napa was put on the world stage as far as winemaking. And today, as I reflect over the judgment of Paris, I'd like to present a different way of looking at it. Um, I'd like to challenge you to constantly seek out new wines from new regions you have yet to explore and discover new stories, new takes on old varietals, um, new styles of winemaking, and in general, expand your palate. Explore more nuance and understand more context and attach that context to that nuance. I think the irony, as I reflect on the judgment of Paris, I find a lot of irony in the fact that <laughs> Napa, which had been put on the map by this defining moment, um, has led to a lot of ingrained, entrenched mindsets that somehow <laughs> the best California wines come out of Napa. They don't. Not even close. And it's not until you challenge yourself to venture out that you'll quickly realize this. And uh, that pretty much speaks to my journey with Wine Snob. For well over a decade now, I've been collecting, visiting, following small artisan winemakers, not unlike the folks who put Napa on the map, the folks who were toiling, making, following their life's dream and passion out in Napa Valley back in the 70s. Now, <laughs> I'm sure I don't need to remind you, none of those folks remain in Napa today. They've either since retired, departed, uh, sold out, been bought out by large interests, corporate interests, and that want to um, capitalize on the legacy that they left behind and the brand behind Napa Valley. And I think that's great. That's fantastic. They've built a burgeoning wine world or industry out there. Um, that is highly sought after around the world and I think that's fantastic and the entire wine industry at large benefits from it um, but make no mistake California wines if you want to explore the true frontiers of California wines if you want to understand taste expand your horizons and your palate your experience and truly immerse yourself in the essence of California winemaking, it won't be in Napa. I'm pretty convinced of this now. I've been out here in California. I'm about an hour, hour and a half from Napa. Um, I'm pretty sure of this, but you have to get out to see it for yourself. So therein lies the irony. The same culture that Steven Spurrier eschewed and challenge himself to think outside of um, led and that led to Napa being what it is has now arisen again and very much so uh, I have friends who <laughs> you know they go on wine tasting and you live in California and there's only one place you can think of going of all the amazing regions we have so today I'd like to challenge each and every one of you to go off the beaten path and join the vibrant exchange and conversation on Wine Snob, either on the blog or on Instagram, and point out those little gems you find. Uh, interesting wines, 
I love wines with a story, um, just by humble men and women out there, just following their passion, pursuing their dreams, and not making a compromise on it, just like the winemakers that put Napa on the map in the 70s. I think the journey of you discovering those hidden gems will be far more worth the while than any other experience you've had in wine appreciation, wine enthusiasm, and wine tasting. So that's why if you look at the Wine Snob feed, you may notice not very much Napa. And it's not by choice, it's just I love wines that are have a real and actual story. Less so much a legacy, that's someone else, um, what someone else accomplished decades ago, but more of an act, real and actual story by real and actual people. And the wines and the level of quality of the wines they put out have been consistently humbling. And just when I think I've seen it all in a specific region, oh, I've come to really grasp what that region is about and what it has to offer. I've been proven wrong time and time again. And just when I started making generalizations about certain lesser known regions, I've been proven wrong time and time again. Uh, so, be it from the Sierra foothills to the Sonoma coast or from Alexander Valley to the Central Valley, or North Coast to Central Coast, Santa Barbara, you're going to find, if you push yourself and challenge yourself to venture and stay off the beaten path, you will find some amazing wines, like most of the wines I've been collecting and following in here. Wines that will present layer and nuance like you've never seen before. Wines with complexity that, to be honest, I don't think you'd find in France. I, I love Bordeaux. I drink a lot of Bordeaux. Um, I keep and follow some. My favorite region is Margot. Um, Loire Valley is another favorite region of mine, Chinon. And I like how the terroir is expressed over there from that region. I think it's unique to that region. Those are the things I like about wine. If we go up to the Sierra foothills, I love how the granite and the terroir in general expresses itself with this very unique wet mineral star anise. It's so unique to that region and um, it's so familiar and so haunting at the same time. I love it. Um, if you go down to, to say uh, the Russian River, there's a certain silty, loamy, sedimentary essence to the wines, especially the Pinots. Uh, if you go down the Santa Rita Hills in Santa Barbara, you get this crisp berry expression. And the wines are so subtle and delicate. It's so rich. And this is the kind of context that really draws me into wines and keeps me off the beaten path. I think only that's the only way you really get to indulge in that level of nuance and subtlety and more importantly the story being able to walk into a winery and have the owner winemaker vintner uh, pour your tasting for you and tell you their story their story for that day that week or the last decade and how they got there. It adds a lot of dimension and richness to it. And very often it's really humbling to see the level of quality of the wines coming out of someone who would otherwise be dismissed casually by established ingrained mindsets. So on this day of judgment of Paris, remember how it came about, remember 
who was behind it, Steven Spurrier. And uh, he recently passed away, may he rest in peace. And uh, I think what he would like of us all is to continue venturing off the beaten path. Jump on Wine Snob. Um, most of the wines I review have a very personal story attached to them by the winemaker, um, their journey, uh, the owners, and how they got there. Um, and uh, they bring that level of subtlety, nuance, complexity, and uh, context. Uh, jump on there, explore some of those. If you're looking for a starting point, it's a good starting point. Look at the feeds on Wine Snob. Those are a good starting point. And uh, if you venture even further off, you have to come back and let me know. I would love to know and I'd love to go try those wines as well. Tonight, what am I having? The Judgment of Paris. Well, I decided to open a bottle of one of my all-time favorite winemakers, the first inaugural Wine Snob Winemaker of the Year. Uh, Terre Rouge Eastern Wines, and this is their 2012 Zinfandel. And uh, it's a good reminder of why I stay off the beaten path and why I do this and why I want to share it with the world. So let me know what you think in the comments below and uh, I'll put links below on uh, more information of the Judgment of Paris. Uh, be sure to check out the movie Bottle Shock. Have some fun with it. Um, let me know what you drank, what you opened to enjoy uh, the movie. Uh, let me know what other hidden gems you find off the beaten path. I would very much like to know. And until then, wine snobs, cheers.